Hi, I'm Sofia Fonseca and this is the ONLA podcast, a podcast on African archaeology and heritage. In our first episodes, we'll be interviewing the teachers for our online course on African archaeology and heritage that will be held at the Coursera platform in the beginning of 2021. We count on you to join the course. For now, listen to the teachers and enjoy. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we have with us Tilman Lesson Earths, archaeologist specialized in African archaeology and African rock art from the African Research Unit, Institute of Prehistoric Archaeology of the University of Cologne, and also a member of the Heinrich Barth Institute from the same university. Tilman is one of our teachers and will be giving lectures in three of the four modules of the online course on African archaeology and heritage. In the first module, Tillman gives the introduction to African archaeology. In the second module, regarding methodology, Tillman gives the lecture on African rock art that is completed by Professor Goodman from the University of Namibia. In the fourth module, on case studies, he will present the Daureb rock art project. And hopefully in the future, we'll also have Tillman on the third module of the course, the one dedicated to heritage management, with his colleagues, the Sun Trackers of Namibia, and their project on indigenous knowledge. Dear Tillman, I believe we met in Poznan on the North African Congress organized by Professor Lech Grzyaniak and Professor Kombuchevsky at the Poznan Archaeological Museum many years ago. And finally, finally, we are working together. Welcome, Tillman, to the online podcast. Hello, Sophia. <laughs> nice to see you and hear yes. you. Yes. How are you during this uncertain times? I'm doing fine. Under the present circumstances could be much worse for me. I'm fine. Even home officing is okay for me. So, Tillman, tell us, how did you become an archaeologist? Yes, even as a young guy at school, I started uh, finding an interest for whatever reason. You, you cannot really denominate a, a, a single reason for that. Um, I found fun in learning Kiswahili at school, for example, just for my own, just because I, I, it sounded like a nice language. And so I kept on doing um, things that uh, to find information about Africa, history, stories, whatever. And I started, uh, uh, then my studies were African studies. Um, it was not nothing that would uh, uh, promise you um, a secure position somewhere because there is no jobs for Africanists, actually. Um, you just do it because you, you, you have the luxury to be, being able to decide it. And that's what I did. And so I, but while I was doing African studies, which in the university where I studied in Marburg um, was more or less linguistic studies, but I also started working on archaeological excavations. But Roman times, uh, um, prehistory of, of, of Germany. Um, but of course, archaeology is much about um, the techniques that you have to master. And then you apply these techniques and uh, the methods that you learn uh, in any one of other place as well. So that brought me then to working in other places in Germany, except there where I was studying. And I had an interest in getting to Africa. And so first year I started getting um, employment on excavations in Tunisia, in northern Tunisia. But again, it was on Roman times mainly. Um, and the Numidic, Numidic times, um, but still, then I had my, put my foot on Africa, and so I was uh, sort of happy. And it, it, it brought me to Egypt for some time because my wife, she is an archaeologist as well, and uh, either of us would get an employment on an excavation, and the other one would follow, sometimes even working voluntarily. Um, but uh, it was so we were s sticking together and we're working together and we loved it. And and how did you um, start working in, in Namibia? That is the, 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 the case study that you are presenting in our MOOC is in Namibia and the project is outstanding. Can you explain a little bit the connection between Cologne University, where you are a, um, a researcher for many years now, and the project, the Reb Rock Art Project? 
Yes. Well, the Rockart project actually started um, almost coincidentally. Um, I was in the, the right place and the right moment to be asked to take over in a project where there had been uh, some uh, remarkable guy uh, called Harald Parga doing many years of recordings, field recordings in a very adventurous uh, context. Um, and this uh, Harald Parga, unfortunately, died very surprisingly, almost actually when he was still working. Um, but then there was this huge uh, um, pile of uh, recordings that he had made, and this is uh, world-class material that he has left over behind. And it was obvious nobody will pick up that type of recording and take this, have this stamina and this uh, love for being in out in the nature just with your rucksack and staying there for weeks and just eating um, rice and, and canned fish <laughs> for weeks, you know. <laughs> um, and also, he was a he was a designer, a graphic designer, and he had a very very skilled hand and eye to record for uh, rock art. So it was obvious that the next step should be taken. That step was um, publishing that material, and this is was the job that it was uh, offered to me. Uh, I hadn't had uh, real experience in in publishing, um, but uh, coming from a linguistic studies. Uh, you, sir, you learn certain systematics and combining this with your knowledge of archaeology and the systematics that you learn there, uh, it was quite a nice preparation for doing something entirely new, uh, publishing this rock art. And well, we, I was employed for doing it and just it was just a test for one year what's going to happen and the next year followed and another year followed and still another year followed. So eventually it was 20 years of working on the publication and it is a long row of books. It's, uh, it's more than almost a meter on the bookshelf that we published eventually. Um, and yeah, then... Of course, then you are in, you know. Uh, we traveled so many times to Namibia to go to those places that we were publishing about. I was about to, to write something significant and relevant about these uh, rock art sites. So, of course, I had to travel there and see them all. And that gave me the advantage that I went through that mountain area where these um, sites had been recorded and... Um, it was my job to go to every single one of these more than 800 sites and um, take uh, collect new data there and make new photographs and get more information than that what you can uh, uh, glean from the tracings that Harald Paga had left behind. <clears throat> and from a project like that, when you get into an issue very deeply and then you link up with the people in the area, which is a very important point because we rely on the people living there. We rely on them as mountain guides. We rely on them as field assistants. So, of course, you know them very well. I know people for more than 30 years. You become friends, of course. You have passed weeks and weeks and months in, together in the wilderness living every day from the early morning to the, to the late evening, doing everything together, you know, um, then you have to have, have their people and characters who can adapt to a situation like that and that you don't get, <clears throat> like, mad about the other one because uh, he doesn't, doesn't want to adapt to the situation. So it's a very extreme situation and there is no way to... Uh, to get some detraction because every day you're out in the field, every day is a work day and it's from sunrise to sundown. Tillman, and regarding what you are saying, the colleagues from the Daurev Mountain Guides, um, it's a beautiful story. We also have them uh, at the course. They will give, um, they are part of the man heritage management a module. They will explain us their experiences. But I would like to hear a little bit about your connection with them or did it come to truth this this dream of them to be guides official guides and how did your um, also expertise or uh, and teaching and learning together went through the years because i know there is a deep connection as colleagues as friends um, to take care of that amazing heritage in the Dore mountain in namibia 
Yeah, there is a nice story about this, or it is a nice story uh, as such. Um, there were these young guys in the school, at the secondary school in Uis, the, the only town in the uh, surroundings of 100 kilometers from uh, that mountain. Um, and these guys, they, they lived when uh, having that mountain in front of their um houses or their village every day for years and years and years but nobody really thought this was a place for them to go or a place for them they would have an interest in and then there came this one teacher there who for himself was just uh, uh, for personal interest was interested in going to the mountain and looking at the rock art and he thought these young guys here at school they should know about these rock art so he, uh, he introduced them very shortly to those places where you can get uh, sort of easily um, and a number of them Perhaps not all, but a number of them, they've really found an interest in, in this art. And he, he approached us then because he knew we were working in that area for so many years. And he asked us whether we could give them some more decent, more um, archaeological and scientific in, introduction to rock art. And that's what we did. We invited them. We had open air uh, um, uh, schooling at the rock art sites, uh, being very close to the art and having the, the chance to show out all these um, particularities of the art right in place. So there were some of them who really got an interest. <clears throat> and then what happened there, that was in the year 1990, uh, in this small town, it, it actually lived on a tin mine that was mining there and all the people living there had employment there. Um, and the tin mine closed down and the people living in place, the local people, they had no, virtually no other um, income possibility there. There was nothing, really nothing. There was one employer and that one employer went away and the people were left in the, in the margin of the desert. And it, it really is a desert environment there. So they had really troubles, but they had the rock art there. And they, the, the rock art drew some tourists there always. And so they started, uh, first of all, they started guarding the cars of the tourists. And then some tourists started asking, uh, can you help me find the rock art? And so they, they would start guiding, but only because they knew the way there, but they were not really trained for that and they had no particular knowledge. And then in the next years, they started uh, getting getting more training on, on rock art, getting on guiding and so forth. And that is where we came in as well. Um, providing training on rock art, on archaeology. And our approach was always the one that uh, every guy there at the mountain, she or he would have to know more than any tourist will read from his tourist guidebooks. <clears throat> and that's what, of course, what, what you can do. And, and these guys, they are very knowledgeable today. And um, they have had many trainings on botany, on geology, on on animals or whatever you have. And what they also bring, and importantly, is their own cultural knowledge, in particular about uh, living in this in this environment, how to deal with a, with a, a dry dry environment, what you, use you can make from, from so many plants which are growing there. And so forth, this is also a part of an important part <clears throat> which no one can teach them from our side, from the academic side. It's the knowledge which they bring from their um, parents, grandparents, from their ancestors. And so this combines very, very nicely uh, with the guides uh, at the Brandbeck Mountain. It's not only academic and, and Western type of knowledge, it's also the indigenous knowledge which feeds into the guiding tools that, that they provide yes, there it's, at the it's really outstanding the work they do and the, the way they guide because what you are saying the academic knowledge but also the ancestry knowledge and the livelihood it's presenting <coughs> even the way they bring the tourists and the knowledge they bring to us it's it's really beautiful um, another thing that I think connects very well with the other project that you you are now developing there in Namibia regarding the knowledge of the sand trackers of Namibia with the indigenous, indigenous knowledge and putting together that with academic knowledge to study rock art. 
Can you tell us a little bit about it? Because it's not yet, hopefully it will become part of the MOOC, this case study, but it's so interesting. And I think it's such an interesting way of studying um, rock art that I would like you to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, when you deal with rock art, in particular in Namibia, you also de deal with the with the life of hunter-gatherers. Uh, the rocket in Namibia was made by hunter-gatherers. And Namibia is also a country not only rich in rock art, but also rich in people who used to live as hunter-gatherers. Of course, in the modern times, um, people have all kinds of, of income. Sometimes they have no income um, because they are not able to do hunting and gathering because many of the most of the areas of this country, as in all other countries in Southern Africa or across Africa and across the world, was taken away from the indigenous people. And so they can't stick to their traditional lifestyle, which they master and for which they have the adequate knowledge to survive in an environment uh, with which the likes of us would only be able to in, to survive with a huge technological um, um, uh, effort and with a lot of um, things and inventions we would need to survive. But these people know uh, how to survive because they know everything in their in their uh, life world so very well and they have a knowledge which comes from generations and generations of ancestors and accumulated knowledge which goes in many things um, which are dealing with nature far beyond any scientific knowledge and that is actually the point where we've had an, some flash of uh, understanding because we were dealing a, a colleague of mine Andreas Pastors we were dealing also with the European rock art which in, in Europe is in deep caves and it was mostly produced during the ice ages so it is like 15,000 and then even more years old like 15 to 30,000 years old and that period of time in in the northern hemisphere we had the, uh, the ice ages and people would also uh, go into the big caves that you find in in certain geological formations, in particular in southern France and northern Spain. And the people went there producing rock art. But also what we find from that time, the rock art is one thing, uh, what we find from these periods as well is the footprints of those people. So the people walking there like 17,000 years ago into one of those caves and producing rock art or doing something else, we do know there is rock art, but we do not know whether all the footsteps we see are of those people who really made the art. But be that as it may, um, we have footprints of people 17,000 years ago. And knowing about the uh, knowledge um, of hunter-gatherers, you know that uh, tracking is one of their main survival tools. They have to know from any trace in the ground, they know have to, how to read it. As much as we can go uh, in the morning uh, to look at the newspaper, what's happening, uh, what ha was happening around us, they go out of their house and look at the steps in front of the door and read what has been happening in the last night. So this is a, a sort of a uh, funny way of, of telling what, uh, what tracking is, is, is capable to do, but it's a, it's a means of survival. And they learn it from small on, small children, before our children know how to read written things. Small children uh, in, in the hunter-gatherer society need, know how to read the tracks, at least, of their parents. They know the first track they learn and they will be able to, to distinguish from any other thing is the track of the mother, of course. They will know where, how to find their mother because they can follow the tracks, even as a small child. And then they keep on picking up, picking up, picking up until they know everyone in the village by the footprint. And they know all the animals around and they know every individual animal. If they've seen one uh, footprint or, or, or hoof print of or one particular animal, they will recognize it and will be able to distinguish it from any other uh, same, or, uh, animal of the same species. So this is some very, very deep, uh, lifelong uh, learning type of, uh, of knowledge that they have, and they have to train it uh, their lifelong. Because if you stop uh, tracking, you unlearn it. Um, that, that's, a, that's a problem when these people are uh, prohibited to, to go hunting. But there are, uh, is one area in Namibia where the people are still allowed to hunt in the traditional way, 
<clears throat> so they use a bow and arrow and they follow the tracks. That's how they can still get meat for themselves. And these people are skilled trekkers and they are world-class uh, trekkers and they are trekkers who are as good as the ones who, uh, who were hunting 2,000 years, 10,000 years ago, uh, anywhere in the world. And now this was obvious to us. Uh, if we have footprints and we want someone to read them, we must not go there like we are illiterate in reading tracks, but there are people who are very literate in reading tracks. And this is how we came to establish the project um, Tracking in Caves. We invited uh, Namibian trackers, three of them, to Europe, and we went with them into the uh, Paleolithic caves, and we had them uh, look at these tracks that they find there, and they would tell us the story of what had been happening there. Where you know, archaeologists make a scan and takes a lot of measures and takes photographs and whatever. Yes, uh, you have an, a photograph, but you don't understand even uh, anything else, but uh, that's a footprint. But the trackers, they will be able. No, this is a guy who was only 15 years old, and here was another guy with him. He is uh, like in the end of his 30s, and they were working here together. Or this was a man and a woman who were walking through here. Uh, they were always walking together there, and they were apparently looking for beer bones and teeth of bears and what they were searching inside the cave and they can tell the story here they walked together this way and there they were back together um, now they were carrying something heavy because when they're going in the footprints were not as steep in the ground as in the on the way back but still we are talking about millimeters in difference which you with an untrained eye won't, won't be able to differentiate but for them it's it, it's their job it's their business it's their life and that's how they can tell us things which no science uh, of today will be able to to get even near to in knowing i think it's so so interesting and beautiful even to be able to to understand better our ancestors in europe of the rock caves and and by using the knowledge of uh, of the traditional knowledge of people in Namibia, it's just beautiful. And and it's very interesting because even in nowadays world with the climate change and all that is happening, um, I do believe in indigenous knowledge regarding adaptation, as you were saying, to arid areas can give us so much understanding of things. And we lost a little bit that knowledge and it's Sometimes you can go further or you know, to, to, to this kind of tradition knowledge to, to apply today. It's very interesting. Yeah. I was, uh, when I got deeper into this uh, tracking knowledge, I was so much fascinated about this, um, <clears throat> this kind of learning and the way of linking so many things together. These people are considered, of, you know, they're hunter gatherers, and that's in, in normal language, it's considered primitive yeah. uh, uh, societies. But their knowledge and their learning is so complex. And they have this type of networks um, of knowledges because as a tracker, you don't only, it's not only that you know about this one animal that you, that you are following and that you just recognize a shape in the track, but you have to know <clears throat> the entire um, behavior of that animal. You have to know how it behaves uh, during the day, the differences in the morning and the afternoon, which there are differences. Um, differences in time of the year, differences whether they have young ones or not. And then you have to know all the other animals which are around. And I'm not talking about the other big animals. You know, have, even have to know about the, the behavior of insects, um, how this relates to, to the bigger animals, how the tracks of the insects, how they um, relate to the behavior of the animal. Um, you have to know about the plants. You have to about, know about the soil. You have to know about the weather conditions. You have to know about um, the, the, the climatic changes over the year. What does it do to the soil? What does it do to the plants in order uh, to understand the aging process of a, of a track? If there is a wind, of course, the track changes much faster than if, when there's no wind. But this is a very, very uh, simple thing. They, they pick it up when just passing by when running through, they will be able to, to, dis, uh, to discern on, and, and to see the track of, uh, of a person when, when they're running by in a car. You won't believe that. Yeah? There's stories, uh, so many about this, um, the ability to learn, 
the ability to memorize, <clears throat> because you have to memorize uh, when you follow a track, like for an elephant, they remember the cracks in the, in the sole of the elephant. But you have to distinguish from, from all other elephants which are running there. So actually, this means as, as if you could remember the, 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 the fingerprint of one finger of a one person and recognize it in some other place. So there's an enormous um, um, demand on having extremely good memory. And of course, you have to memorize the landscape in which you are. There's no maps and there's no road signs or anything. You can easily get lost. You have to memorize how a tree looks in order to be able to find your way back. Um, so it is, it is nothing but, uh, or it has nothing to do with primitiveness, but, but it's an um, intellectual, an extremely demanding thing. To, to be a hunter-gatherer and living in, a, in an arid environment or in any one environment. Um, we don't see that like this most of the time. You think that us as academics, we are uh, demanding most of what you can from your brains, but we can look up everything. And especially today, you know, we have a, always a smartphone at hand and you, if you don't know anything, you just go Completely. and Google it. Uh, they don't have any Google. They have to have it all in their mind and then, the final fascinating point in this is as well, they don't have any formal learning. But when I'm talking about this extremely complex um, knowledge that they have, every parent, every mother, every father has to take care that the entire cultural knowledge is being transferred to the young generation. And you don't have schooling, you don't have tests, you don't have any uh, kind of control over whether this works or not. But, but the control is survival, and the people would not survive if they were not successful in transferring a complex library of knowledge to the next generation, to their children, without any formal uh, force behind it. So knowing about the knowledge of these so-called primitive people um, makes you feel very, very humble because we are having such an easy life in terms of learning and survival. Uh, and these people, they are demanded every day, and, but they do it, and they, they are not suffering from it. They love their life. They want to live as hunter-gatherers, but only uh, conditions of today, they don't allow it. Yes, it's, it's beautifully complex knowledge and also deep connection with the environment. It's, it's really outstanding. And Tillman, for the future, do you have any other projects in mind? And regarding the Onla project, uh, what motivated you to be part of the MOOC or part of the course? And what do you expect it for it? So for me personally, my, my projects are, once you started working with indigenous uh, specialists, you, you won't stop it uh, because you, you see so, there is so much there which we still can learn from them. And they can be so, they have so many methods uh, available to uh, find out things that we can't. And it will take us decades to do this with our um, technical and uh, different type of approach to these things. So uh, projects are on the way still. Uh, some are running. A new one is just in, in the pipeline uh, where we would work together again with hunter-gatherers and doing research which feeds into our um, research and uh, as prehistorians understanding how how does life as a uh, of a hunter-gatherer how is it organized how do they get cope with their challenges of their um, life world of their environments whatever environment it is so we keep on learning uh, from the collaboration uh, with them and but we also uh, try, and this is in all the project that we are running, we want to be sure to give back as much as possible. We have an advantage. Um, I can run my academic career on drawing on the knowledge of others. Um, I'm just then I'm sort of writing it down and, and I have my academic career. Um, so my idea of working as a, as a researcher is also that what you find out, you should bring back to where it comes from. So one thing is training. Another thing is finding ways of communicating those the knowledge and the new um, ideas that we get through that work, um, how we can 
bring that back to the people in an understandable way and that they can make use of it. They can take it up as part of their own cultural history. <clears throat> so for the future, we also uh, plan to get more and more ways of returning uh, knowledge and new knowledge back to those communities with whom we had worked in order to generate that knowledge. Thank you so much, Thielman, to be here today with us and uh, hope to talk with you very soon. I can be here for hours, <laughs> listen to you. Yeah, thank you for giving me so much time. I would, yeah, if you don't stop me, I, I don't stop talking <laughs> today. <isn't it? laughs> thank you so much. You. Talk to you soon, Thielman. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining the conversation with Tillman Lessenhers from the African Research Unit, Institute of Prehistoric Archaeology of the University of Cologne, and a member of the Heinrich Barth Institute from the same university. Tillman is one of the teachers in our MOOC on African Archaeology and Heritage, and the outstanding projects and work he has developed through the years, especially the ones regarding the Daure Brock Art, are a beautiful legacy to African Archaeology. The impact of the project's focus on the indigenous knowledge are a step forward in our way of understanding and working together with the local communities. Embracing this traditional and complex knowledge opens our minds to a new world of possibilities and new perceptions of our human journey. Thank you, Tillman, for that. On the next few weeks, we'll keep on having conversations with our teachers around the course and their personal projects. Subscribe to the podcast and our newsletter and let's be friends on Facebook and Instagram. Take care and keep safe. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>